Ali, you are on the ground. There is one week to go. I said it. You were in Iowa yesterday, New Hampshire tonight. What are you hearing from people on the ground about these three candidates? Look, in Iowa, I think that the goal for Nikki Haley was always to be able to capitalize on sort of the invisible national momentum. She really earned that on the debate stages. But in the grassroots, a lot of the people who were showing up in Iowa, many of them over the course of the last two weeks, were showing up for the first time. Here in New Hampshire, she spent a lot more time. There's a bigger infrastructure built out for her. She's got bigger name endorsers, specifically the sitting governor, Chris Sununu, who's quite popular here among Republicans. All of that should lend to to a good effort for her. But I think the reality is that unless it's a win, it's very difficult for her going down the stretch, which is why they're trying to cast the race starting last night in Iowa. And of course, going into today with ads like the one that you showed, they're trying to cast this as a race that is now a binary decision, not between three candidates, even though DeSantis, Haley and Trump are all still in this. Instead, Haley is trying to cast this as a race between Haley and Trump because they are the two names at the top of the polls in New Hampshire. I would be wrong not to point out that Donald Trump does have a point there when he says that Haley is trying to bank on people who may not be your traditional Republicans. I don't know that she's hoping for an influx of Democrats, but certainly an influx of Democrats might not hurt, especially because the coalition she's trying to build here in New Hampshire is not just one of Republicans, but also one that brings in independents and Democrats. And because of the weirdness of this primary, that could be a coalition that could potentially be enough to top Trump, maybe. <laughs> Tim, how good is it for Trump that Haley and DeSantis are both staying in, right? He's running this major victory lap. But if really it was a one-on-one -on -one caucus last night or ahead in New Hampshire, it would be a heck of a lot closer because basically Haley and DeSantis split the non-Trump vote. You know, Steph, I, you know I hate to disagree with you, but I kind of have to disagree with you on this one. I, right. I think that consolidation helps Trump. I, the, the, Trump ha, would it would get, I think, more DeSantis voters than uh, than Haley would if DeSantis got out. And the second choice, at least in Iowa, bear that out. I, I haven't seen second choice numbers in, in, in New Hampshire. And so in a lot of ways, it might help Haley that DeSantis is in. I, I don't know that it really matters, though. All of this is kind of a big parlor game. When you look at what happened in Iowa, Trump won every demo. You know, I, I, something I was pointing out this morning was in, in Polk County, right, which is where Des Moines is. So that's where you'd think there'd be the more college-educated voters, where it should have been where Haley could do well. Uh, if the whole state had been Des Moines, had been Polk County, Trump still would have won the biggest landslide in Iowa caucus history. So like, if there was not all those evangelical counties and rural counties, throw them all away, just Polk County, that his victory there would have been the biggest in Iowa caucus history. Trump won every demo. So I just, I, you know, I don't know if there's any strategizing that is going to get anybody around, like, the reality of what these voters want, unless there's an influx of new voters in some of these other states. Strategizing, spoken like a true George Bush Republican, paying homage to Will Ferrell right there. Ron, let's talk about Florida, right? Ron DeSantis, we often forget, is the current governor of Florida, though he has spent more time in Iowa in the last six months, certainly than in his home state. Where does DeSantis go from here, right? He barely took second after leaving it all in Iowa, both in the campaign and, and in his political life. Where does he go from here? The biggest question I saw today on, you know, Republican social media, Republican media, is why is DeSantis still in this race? You know, he's been out of the state for nine months <laughs> since the last legislative session with his children, basically moved into Iowa with some side trips to New Hampshire and South Carolina. And Florida is, has not been going especially well in his absence. We lost our state party chair uh, to a sex scandal. Um, he just lost the state rep race today, flipped, this, flipped the Republican seat, lost the Jacksonville mayor race. His, the Florida Republican Party is divided by him running against Trump between Republicans loyal to Trump and Republicans still loyal to DeSantis. He's lost court cases in the last few months. He's, he may take a big loss in the Disney case very soon. So he needs to get back in Florida. So, so I guess that's the big question. We have an insurance crisis. Everybody's asking in Florida is, why is he still in this race when there's really no path to victory? I think I have the answer, but that's what everybody's wondering. What do you think the answer is then? I, I think he's betting on Jack Smith.
You know, and I think if you if you pay very he's betting on criminal cases and cholesterol. I think if you pay oh. very close attention to, to 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 DeSantis and you listen to what he says and you listen to what he says in response to voters is he does not think Trump is going to make it to the finish line. He thinks that Trump is either going to be convicted and, and in jail or something else. And he wants to be still in the game at the convention with some delegates to be there to pick up the pieces if that happens. Okay, he is betting on Diet Coke and the DOJ, but does Ron DeSantis have enough money, Tim, to stay in the race that much longer, right? Jack Smith would love if he was going to trial tomorrow, but we all know that ain't happening, and Trump is using every single lever possible to delay that. Yeah, I'll just say, um, uh, to, to agree with Ron, I, I had a DeSantis Super PAC staffer just a couple of months ago tell me exactly this, right? That they, you know, that they weren't, I don't know that they're expecting Trump was going to get convicted, but they're like, the possibility is high enough that it's worth sticking around and trying to garner delegates just in case that happens. A, a member of the DeSantis Super PAC told me that. So could he keep doing that? I, eventually, the pressure starts to wear down on you, you know, from people in MAGA circles, from all the people in Florida, um, you know, the pressure to, to get behind the presumptive nominee will happen, uh, you know, by South Carolina at least. Could he, though, you know, uh, buck that and keep running uh, with, a, with a small staff? I think so. I, you know, you couldn't run the kind of campaign that he was running in Iowa, burning tens of millions of dollars on door knocks and ads that were totally useless. But, you know, to, as Trump showed in 2016, you can stick around. You can run a campaign with four people if you need to, if you just decide to stay around. So I think he could stay around. He couldn't conduct the type of campaign he's been conducting. Uh, but I, I, kind, I think that eventually the weight of the pressure will probably... Uh, you know, result in him and him conceding to reality. Well, he didn't go home to Florida today, and he also did not go to New Hampshire. Excuse me. Yes, Allie, he went to South Carolina. And our colleague Vaughn Hilliard pointed out the last time we saw that happen was Ted Cruz taking that strategy in 2016. And we all know it didn't work out very well for him. Yeah, well, Ted Cruz also endorsed former President Donald Trump today. So that really does come full circle in the Von Hilliard world of politics for someone who followed from Iowa to Ted Cruz. But I, I do think DeSantis, the one event that he was supposed to do here in New Hampshire before he did a CNN town hall, was ultimately canceled because of weather. I can tell you it did snow here all day, but at the same time, our embeds were able to move around the state. I do hear, though, what Ron and Tim are both saying about this idea of second place potentially being worth waiting around for. I do think that's one of the reasons that we're seeing Nikki Haley try to paint this in a binary fashion, because she wants people to associate it as Trump versus Haley coming down that home stretch for the just-in-case factor of it all. I do think you're looking at as usual, as we usually talk about, an unprecedented moment. You've never had a candidate like Trump with 91 criminal counts against him, defending himself on four different uh, cases in various courts. All of that makes this a very difficult cycle to predict. And so if we look at the delegate strategy, and these guys here who are with us know it well, there really is no world in which I can see Haley or DeSantis or anyone else getting the requisite amount of delegates that they would need to topple Trump, especially because of the ways that he's been able to bend the party in various states, Nevada, Cal California, for example, that the delegate strategy just works for him innately there. Not only that, but I don't know any other state that Nikki Haley, if not here, can win. But the what if factor does kind of loom over all of this legally or otherwise. I'm not as good with my alliterations as you guys are because I haven't gotten much sleep. But that is one of the reasons I think that people are staying in. The counter to that, when you ask how long that can go on, yes, the money is a big factor. And Tim makes the point about the high burn rate of the DeSantis campaign. But the other factor is also political self-preservation. At a certain point, you look at the fact that both Haley and DeSantis are young. Most operatives who I talk to talk to me about, well, in 2028, they'll run or something. There is, amount, there is an amount of calculation that has to go into how long can I wait around before my brand is so irrevocably damaged that I can never mount a bid again. Again, all of this is probably two weeks premature in terms of our of our conversation about it. But it is very much one of those things that's whispered in the ether among campaign reporters and campaign flags.